This is Pat Walter from the Surface Hippie website, and I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, with Dr. Gross from South Carolina. Hi, Dr. Gross. Hello, Pat. How are you doing today? <laughs> Good. Uh, I'd like you to tell some of the potential patients what has been your experience with hip resurfacing, what type of device you use, and a little bit about the cementless devices. Okay. Um, I began hip resurfacing um, uh, in about 1999, so I've been doing this for uh, well over 10 years and um, I've performed over 2,400 resurfacings. Um, you asked about uncemented, uh, that's it. I exclusively do resurfacing with uncemented devices, and I, I pioneered that about uh, four years ago. We started that, and we've got about 1,500, almost 1,400 uh, uncemented resurfacings at this point. Um, my practice is really dedicated to hip resurfacing. Um, uh, about 80% of my cases are hip resurfacing, and I do some total hips and some complex revision surgery and some, some knee replacement, but uh, my primary interest is hip resurfacing. Um, I'm involved in implant design, I have been, and uh, in primarily also in technical improvements in hip resurfacing. So um, my focus is to make resurfacing better, and in this present climate it's a little bit difficult because there have been some, recently some um, negative reports about hip resurfacing and metal-metal hip replacements, and um, uh, rather than, um, than uh, uh, migrate away from those as other surgeons have, um, I, I'm focusing more on figuring out why we have the problems and trying to correct them. Because with, really with any kind of artificial implant system, there are mechanical or technical wear problems and, and we, it's really not clear yet um, which ones in the long run are better, particularly in very high, highly active younger patients. So in hip resurfacing for a long time, the uh, common wisdom has been patient selection of paper after paper um, touts this. So we find out which patients um, have a higher risk of problems and then we say, well, maybe we shouldn't do resurfacing in those patients, we should do total hip in those. What, what always gets missed in that analysis is, you know, what about if you did a total hip in that patient, do they also have higher rate of complications? Because it doesn't necessarily follow that they have a great result with a total hip. And, and there's some evidence to support that, particularly with, for instance, hip dysplasia. You know, they have problems with either operation. So my philosophy is to improve the implants and the techniques and to make uh, resurfacing work for more and more patients rather than just try to focus on the small group that has the very best results with resurfacing. And it's kind of a philo philosophical um, decision, you know, with hip arthritis, um, the main problem is really a loss of the cartilage surface of the joint. That's, that's the basic problem. And there's usually in younger people particularly also some deformity of the bone around that in the, in the socket in the femur that often predisposes to that problem. So it seems logical to me to replace the surface of the car cartilage and do some minor changes to correct the deformities back to normal. And I, I think in most of those cases, in most cases, you don't need to do radical surgery of cutting the head and neck off and putting a stem in to accomplish that. You can, you can correct back to a normal um, uh, biomechanics quite well with the resurfacing. So that's just a matter of philosophy. You, you know, hip replacements also work very well. Um, it's not really clear yet um, uh, in the end which will, which will be the best operation uh, eventually. Um, let me um, let me just talk about some let me just talk about some of the advances uh, that that we have made in hip resurfacing that that have not really clearly made it into the press yet. For instance, one of the early um, problems identified with hip resurfacing many years ago in one paper was that cysts in the femoral had bone loss in the femoral due to arthritis predisposed to a higher failure rate. So many in many papers and in many uh, recommendations that you see written that they say if you have cysts in the femoral head you shouldn't do resurfacing. Well I've never really believed that. Um, those early cases, um, the, the cysts were holes where the, the, the bone was removed, the, the tissue was removed, there were holes in the bone and then they were filled with cement as you cemented on the component. And um, uh, instead of not doing those cases I thought it would be better to bone graft those and then cement over them and now we use uncement techniques, we don't even use cement. And I've kept track of all those cases and um, I'm I've submitted for publication a paper that shows that the risk of failure on the femoral side with cysts is no higher than if you don't have cysts. So simply by bone grafting them instead of filling those cysts with cement, um, we've been able to achieve in a much larger group of patients than that original paper, um, no, no higher rate of failures on the femoral side with cysts. So I, I, think, I think that pretty much debunks the idea of uh, femoral cysts being a negative risk. The, the, this, this, the second issue are femoral neck fractures. Those occur early in the first six months they occur in resurfacing and never in total hip replacement. In total hip replacement, you get a fracture of the shaft, and that's well documented that you know, there's, there's a certain percentage of that happening. Um, but many of the papers on hip resurfacing were focused on 
on the risk of femoral neck fracture and women and older patients who are more prone to it, well, it's, and patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and perhaps patients with cysts. And so the idea was, well, worse bone quality in the femur led to the fracture. That's a logical idea. Well, we actually did a study looking at that. We measured bone density, and we, we, we were able to analyze that the, the, the uh, true factor is bone density. So these other risk factors are just markers for what's underneath, it's bone density. And we were able to very clearly stratify bone density as a risk factor, and we are able to tell people by their bone density what the risk is of the fracture. And even better than that, now that we know that, we can then treat those people with weaker bone with, with uh, um, bone strengthening agents. And we've used uh, Fosamax bisphosphonate, and we have a group of patients who were previously stratified at an 8% risk of femoral neck fracture because of weaker bone, and we treated them with Fosamax, and we have zero now in that same group of patients. So there's just another example of how changing the treatment and looking carefully at why these problems are occurring you can resolve these problems and eliminate those complications rather than just abandoning those patients. Say, oh, you can't do resurfacing, you gotta do something else. Uh, and incidentally, I, I, I know of no good data that stratifies bone density with femoral fractures in total hip, but it's likely to be the case also. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just logical. If you have weaker bone and you stick implants in, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna have some higher risk of breakage. Um, the, the third problem was it has been dysplasia. Uh, third example of that. Um, early on, I noticed about a 5% failure rate in socket fixation in dysplasia in my patients. Well, um, the, the problem is dysplasia has a, patients have an oval socket. There are very degrees of that, and it's hard to get a round socket without screws to, to work to get fixation in dysplasia. And that's the problem we encountered. So um, a new socket was de developed that had some spikes on it. So you don't Instead of putting screws through it, which you can't do in a resurfacing, we have one with spikes. We started using that in all the severe dysplasia cases in about uh, 2007. And since that time, so in four years, we've not had a single failure of cup fixation in the dysplasia case, cases. So another problem solved. So we're just going down, down the list. It's femoral cysts by bone grafting, femoral neck fractures by, by um, uh, stratifying patients and treating them differently if they have weaker bone, and now um, dysplasia socket fixation. Um, the next big issue that's now come up really in the last few years is this issue of wear. And um, this has really scared a lot of people away from metal bearings. And um, some of the, one of the early studies that really made a lot of um, headway in the press or, or convincing people was a study that showed that, that these seem to be mysterious inflammatory reactions that, that they couldn't correlate with any particular component position, and, and uh, they did, were able to correlate it with you know, women had a higher risk of it, dysplasia patients had a higher risk, and those with smaller implant sizes. Um, but numerous uh, surgeons now have, have been able to figure out that the primary problem really is how we place the cup. And still there are some patients who are at higher risk, and it's not clear why. Maybe there are certain groups of patients like dysplasia who have a more deformed socket where we are more prone to put the cup wrong. We haven't really figured this out, but that's my suspicion um, because we use landmark, bony landmarks to place the cup. And there's, there are very few studies that show how often we place the cup in the supposed ideal range. We all sort of have this picture of an ideal range. I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to really figure out what the ideal range is. Um, the studies so far have been very crude, but there was one recent study um, published saying that, you know, uh, cups are placed too steep in about 30% of the cases. So out of range in just how steep they are, 30% of the cases in total hip replacement. Well, and if you don't use metal bearings, you don't have the metal wear problems, but you have breakages of implants, you have a plastic wear problems, you have dislocation. So with every with metal wear, with metal implants, it's clear you get wear problems. You don't get dislocations if you put the cup too steep. But it, it seems to be, uh, research study after research study seems to show it's, um, cup position, particularly if you put the cup too steep, and to a lesser degree if you cup, put the cup too tilted forward, or what we call antiversion. And uh, Cone de Smet has done some great work in that regard. Uh, David Langton and Tony Nargal in England, and uh, Justin Cobb has done some CT studies. And it's becoming very clear um, that, that the initial studies were wrong. It's, it's not mysterious, it's, it's cup position. So our focus really needs to be on positioning these cups more accurately. And um, in that regard, we started doing that in 2007, and, and a, a, a study has just uh, been accepted for publication where we've been able to dramatically reduce the number of cups that are too steeply placed just by using x-ray techniques in surgery. And, um, and we've refined those techniques to the point now, we've just looked up our last 400 cases we've done over the last uh, uh, um, uh, little over a year 
Um, and we, look, we take a very, very um, uh, challenging look at that cup uh, by look, taking a standing x-ray. Many people take the x-ray in a lying position. I think that's a mistake because people change the way they position their pelvis when they stand up. I think that's the critical position. That's not proven yet, but I think that's the challenging position. And we have standing x-rays on 400 straight patients uh, with no cup angles above 50 degrees. So with a refinement and x-ray technique, you can get close to perfect in, in avoiding too steep of a cups. And I think that will then translate into um, even fewer wear problems. The other cup position that's critical is the, anti the tilt, the antiversion. And that's much more difficult to, to measure on x-ray. Some people think they can. It's very difficult, particularly with these large bearings. So we have some other work in progress on how to do that. Um, it may take CT studies and so forth. So that's, that's still a factor. We can still, uh, we still need to um, do more critical work in getting that anterior tilt exactly right and reproducible in every patient. So if you have a study where you have an average cup position, that's not good enough. What you really need to know is how many are, are out of the range, above the angle. Mm -hmm. And again, just a study published in Total Hips this year, a very large study from a large center, showed 30%, even after a tens intensive teaching, the cups were too steep. And now with x-ray techniques, in the last year, with 400 cases, we've had no cups above 50 on a standing x-ray. So with refinements and techniques, I think we can get there and get good cup positions. And I think that's the way we're going to going to uh, eliminate, eliminate these wear problems, but you know, there's, we still need uh, years of work to, uh, to demonstrate